So, we start on page 248. It's handy to have your sheet before you as you do this uh, to trace the things that happen on Sunday and uh, as well following. Now, ladies, the resurrection uh, accounts of the Lord Jesus uh, are, are good for you. You should love them particularly. Why is that the case? Why, why do the ladies get excited, or should at least, about the uh, resurrection accounts? You're not excited about it? You would expect after traveling around with the disciples for those three years that they'd be the ones that would see him first, but he doesn't do that. It's the ladies. Uh, ladies that supported him, ladies that anointed his body. Uh, I think there's a reason for it that... Uh, will uh, demonstrate that uh, like with uh, Mary and the, the virgin birth concept where it, it begins being addressed to a lady and ends with the resurrection first being addressed to ladies that uh, the cold-hearted, logical men uh, are not entrusted with these wonderful truths at the beginning. And if if in fact you have the ladies who uh, have uh, an instinct, an intuitive uh, truth concept in them at the beginning and at the end. Uh, then the, the man comes on and he's finally convinced by womanhood. Isn't that wonderful? I, I like that kind of thing. You know, Joseph wouldn't believe Mary at the beginning. And the disciples wouldn't believe the women at the end. And they were right both times. Don't you love that, ladies? Right both times, I tell you. They were really right. Really right when it comes to miracles. Logical men would never believe in miracles. Women believe what God says. The women, top of the page, who had come with him from Galilee, followed Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Joseph. And uh, sitting opposite the tomb, uh, they saw where they put his body in. They returned and got spices ready for anointing. Again, you uh, get some insight into how bodies were respected by godly people in Old and New Testament time. It's nothing to be discarded and thrown in a heap. It's part of who you are. It will be resurrected. It's your DNA. And they treat the body. You see this throughout Scripture. They treat the body with respect and honor. They wash it. They prepare spices. They properly take care of the, the closing practices of life, the funeral, and that sort of thing. It's a very important part. We talked about that already. And uh, they returned, prepared spices on the Sabbath, rested according to the commandment. Uh, and the next day, that is uh, the day after the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Look, he said he was going to raise from the, or be raised from the dead. So make the tomb secure. And they did. Uh, they, they, they'll say they stole it or something like that. So they, uh, uh, made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a garden. And this is not to say they put an enormous, uh, amount of wax and that sort of thing over. It would be the, the, uh, seal of the Roman government across the, just a ribbon like the yellow ribbons, the coroner's office, do not come here kind of thing. And it was secure and they set a guard there. After the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Now they had a problem. Uh, how are we going to get into the tomb? There was a great earthquake. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the Roman guards trembled, became like dead men. And the ladies get there, and they're saying, Who's going to roll the stone away? Verse 3. Who will roll the stone away for us from the door of the tomb? Who's going to roll the stone? This is not an enormous boulder like you see in the commercials for the Ford trucks, where you put chain around and drag it out. It's a disc, but it's a heavy disc. One of the things about a disc, you've seen pictures of it in the traditional site of the, uh, uh, of the tomb, 
Uh, you can roll it, but it takes some strength. Now, girls, are you ready to admit this, that men generally are stronger than women? Is that a problem for anybody? Well, I mean, that's the way you want it. If you marry a guy that's weaker than you are, you're all in trouble. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's the way it is. It's not that it couldn't be rolled. It's something that a couple of ladies couldn't do. You get a good husk, couple of stout monks, and they can do it. So uh, who will roll a stone? When they come, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, you got the, the toughest thing about these appearances is uh, watching the movement. Okay, you have the ladies coming, and, and they come, and they see the tombstone rolled away, that disc rolled away. And uh, look in paragraph 238. So she, this is Mary Magdalene, went to Simon Peter the other, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, that's John, and went to Peter and John. She did, Mary Magdalene. She didn't go in. She didn't hear about the, the angels and the others uh, as the others did. She left. So this is the women minus Mary Magdalene who's going to say, the tombstones rolled away. The angel said to the women who remained, do not be afraid. That's familiar, isn't it? What do angels say when they appear to human beings? This is right at the beginning. Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Don't be afraid, Mary. Here at the end of the life, don't be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. This is a great verse. He is risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. And entering the tomb. How many of you have entered a tomb? Would you go rushing into a tomb? Does that slow you down a little when you go in where a body was just before? They go in. Didn't find the body. And they're perplexed. Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened, bound their faces to the ground. And they said, Do not be amazed. You see Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Boy, the angels are happy about this. See the place where they laid him. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day rise. That's what the angels are saying. They remember what Jesus said. And they're saying, why don't you remember that? And then they did. And he said, go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And they're down in Jerusalem. That's where the crucifixion took place. Beat it to Galilee. He's going to meet you there. They went out and fled from the tomb for from, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. They said nothing to anyone. They were afraid. Now Peter and John are on the scene. Why did Peter come? Why did Peter and John come? Mary Magdalene had read and said, the, run to them and said, the tomb's empty. The, it's been rolled back. What's going on? Peter then came out with the other disciple, the other disciple being John. And they both ran. Now, John's a very humble guy. The other disciple out, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Who got to the tomb first? John did. He says that. I'm faster than Peter. Okay? Simon Peter, I mean, he didn't go in because he's a little timid. Then Simon Peter came following him. He went into the tomb. Would you expect Peter to? Yeah, he walked on the water. All the rest of them, a little timid, stayed in the boat. He got out, walks on the water. When no one else will speak, Peter will speak. When somebody else will enter the tomb, Peter will. As I've said before, it may have just been momentum of the fatter apostle that once running he couldn't stop, you know. But he's in first. Inside Simon Peter came following him. He went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the napkin which they had over his head, not lying with the, clo the linen clothes, rolled up in a place by itself. And so he cleaned up the room before he left. The other disciple who reached the tomb first, he really is caught on that, isn't he? <laughs> reached the tomb first. He also went and he saw and he believed. Whereas yet they did not know the scripture, they must rise from the dead. Why wouldn't they know that? He told them that five or six times by now. Remember those verses? It was hidden from them. Sovereignly. The disciples went back to their home. Okay, now. Mary had gone to get Peter and John. Peter and John came. They got the good word. They left. Now Mary gets back and nobody's there. 
This is the first post-resurrection appearance to Mary Magdalene. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. Now, she hadn't heard what the angel said, remember? She saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Because they have taken my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. Saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know it was Jesus. Why wouldn't she know it was Jesus for the love of Pete? Why? Pardon? Hidden it? That's one option. We've seen that happening a number of times. Well, what is Mary doing? She's weeping. What happens when you weep? You've got tears in your eyes. What happens when you have tears in your eyes? Everybody sort of looks the same. Have you ever noticed that? It's blurry. And here a couple of angels glaring white thing, and here's Jesus in his resurrected body, whatever that appearance, external appearance that would have. He'd be recognizable, but different. And uh, he was wearing something, I'm sure. He just didn't come out and straighten out the clothes and resurrected it naked for the love of Pete. Yeah, oh, don't even think that. He had something on. And she didn't recognize it. Why are you weeping? Weeping. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, uh, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. I love this. It's the first thing Jesus says. Mary. And she turned and said, Teacher. She knew who it was by the word. Mary. And she says, Teacher. And grabs him. Kaboom. Jesus said, do not hold me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. This is not, do not touch me. It's perfectly legitimate to touch him. This is a word for hold. They're not going to take you away. And Jesus is saying, I have to go to heaven, Mary. Don't hold me. You can touch me. And they do touch him. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. You go tell the brethren that. So now Mary takes off to go back. The ladies are on their way already. Peter and John know there's no body in the tomb, but that's all they know. Mary now has seen the Lord, and she's the one that's going to take the good news back. Now Jesus appears to the other women returning to the city. Behold, Jesus met them and said, Hail! And they came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. You see, it's not bad to touch him. Then Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and they'll see me there. Returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene went and said to the disciples, so you have these two groups, Mary who had seen the Lord personally, and then these ladies that he caught up with a little later, told them they had seen the Lord. And they said, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mother of James and the other women who told this to the apostles. It seemed that they didn't believe them. Didn't believe them. Well, we'll pick that up in a little bit. While they were going, behold, the uh, guard went into the city. you got a problem on your hands. The soldier, Roman soldiers had been placed there to guard the body. And uh, they didn't guard the body. Now, anybody in any army or any sort of armed forces knows this. If what you have been required to guard disappears, you're a dead man. That's even true nowadays. This is fearful. And they come to, and what do they see? The stone's rolled away, the body is gone, the Roman seal has been broken by a power greater than the Roman Empire. And they don't know what to do. Some of the guard went to the city and said to the chief priest, they knew what to do. They went to the chief priest and said, the body is gone. Now we have another meeting of the Sanhedrin. They got a problem on their hands. When they had assembled with the elders and took counsel, they gave these Roman soldiers a sum of money and said, tell the people his disciples came by night and stole him away while he was asleep. That's good. 
And then they said, we know you'll get in, pro in trouble. If you, and if this comes to the governor's ears, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Isn't that neat? So uh, these Roman soldiers make a lot of money out of the deal, and they're protected themselves. If, if there's a, some say, uh, uh, they went to sleep, the Jewish authorities will take care of it. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. You can still pick up books. Let's say, you know, it was a deal. They came and stole his body and silenced. This thing's been, perpetu <coughs> been perpetuated. Top of the page, 253. Uh, paragraph 244, you have to go into other accounts for this, so we won't go into them. But here's our famous story, the Emmaus Road Experience. Uh, the very day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. There it is. About seven miles from Jerusalem. This was one of the suburban city ministries in the Luke account. And they're talking about what happened on the way. We've heard numerous messages on this segment, so we can go a little faster here. Uh, Jesus appears, and, and they don't recognize him. Now, their eyes were, were covered in that sense. Didn't, didn't recognize him. And they tell this story to this stranger, Jesus, who joins them in a walk along the road to Emmaus, such a few miles outside of Jerusalem. Verse 24, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but they did not see him. Nobody seen him. The women came back and said he was alive. When, uh, and Jesus says, verse 25, oh, foolish men, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And this is the school's motto verse. And beginning with Moses and all the scriptures, all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. That would be Old Testament scripture. None of the new have been written. All those prophetic things where it says thus, that scripture might be fulfilled, all of that and more. So they drew near to Emmaus, to the village where they were going, and he made as though he would go further. Do you see what Jesus does here? He fakes them out. The Lord gives a little head fake. He says, oh, nice being with you guys. See you. He meant as though he was going to go on, but he didn't want to go on. He faked them out. They said, no, no, why don't you come in and have a meal with us? Stay with us. It's toward evening. Days far spent. So he went in as if to stay with them. Uh, he's playing a little game. When he sat at table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave, gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him. Uh, it will say later through the breaking of bread. It becomes a very significant term, the breaking of bread. Did not our hearts burn with him? And he vanished out of their sight. The Lord does this in his glorified body. He comes and goes like that. He breaks the bread. They say, oh, you're he's gone. Yeah. Whoa. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, this Sunday, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, probably that same upper room, found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them and said, the uh, disciples, the Lord has risen indeed and appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Isn't that interesting? And as they were saying this, Jesus stands among them. There he is. Whoa! Right through the door. It gives you a hint of what our glorified bodies will be like. Appear, disappear. Beam me up, Scotty, kind of thing. You're gone. And that's what happens with Jesus. He's standing there. He says, just like he had said in John, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened. Suppose they had seen a spirit. And he upbraids them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. You didn't trust the ladies. Bad. <laughs> I love it. He said, why are you troubled? Why do questionings rise in your heart? See my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Handle me. See me. For a spirit has not flesh and bones. He showed them his hands and his feet and his side. 
And while they still disbelieved for joy and wondered, he said, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Why'd he do that? Ghosts don't eat. You want to see that I'm alive in my body? I've been resurrected. Give me a meal. I take great encouragement from this verse. Resurrected bodies eat. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? Hey, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb after all. It's not look at pictures. They were glad when they saw the Lord. <coughs> he said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, which uh, they will receive in a fuller way on Pentecost. Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Thomas is a twin. Any of you twins? One twin? Uh, we had twins. Uh, uh, our first uh, experience with children was twin. Well, we were expecting one, got two. It was That's a whole story in itself. Now, what do you know about Thomas, the twin? What do you call him? Downing Thomas. He's a twin. Why would they tell you he's a twin? What significance is that? Why waste a word of inspired text if there's not a lesson in it for us? Where was Thomas when the others were there? He was out by himself. The twins are never by themselves. To have your own identity as a twin is a little bit of a struggle, and you wonder who you are sometimes. And I see Thomas going through that. The security dimension, you'd think it'd be more secure, but individual security, it's, you know, we're, we've always been together. To be apart is a different thing, and he's a twin, and, and he has trouble deciding, and he's a little pessimistic. He's the one. That, he's Eeyore of the apostles, and and he's all off by himself. The rest of them are gathered. He's off by himself, wandering around, trying to make sense out of life. And then when he he does come back, now he's there. He wasn't with them the first time. The disciples said, "We've seen the Lord." He said, oh, "I don't believe that, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side. I will not believe." Eight days later. His disciples were again in the house. Thomas said, was with them this time. Doors were shut just like they were before. Jesus came and stood with them. I said, peace be with you. He said, Thomas, hey, good to see you this time. Where were you the last time? Good to see you. Come up here. Put your finger here. Wait a minute. What does that mean? Why, why did Jesus say that? Put your finger here. He, he knew what Thomas had said. He knows our thoughts, what we speak. And he said, but here, here, my hand, here, 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 put, put your hand on my side. Thomas says, look, my Lord and my God. Look, out of the failure of this man to have faith comes the clearest statement after the resurrection as to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. My Lord and my God. You can't do better than that. And God uses even our failures for his purposes. That's a wonderful thing. We will fail, every one of us, just like Peter did, just like Thomas did. And out of both of them comes enormous truth that helps us all. My Lord and my God. Jesus said, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Who's that? How many of you have ever seen the Lord? None of you. Have you believed? All of you. And he says, blessed are those people. See, we count as real those things we don't see. We count as real the resurrection. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They go up to Galilee where they're told to go in the next paragraph. And this is an exciting passage. They're, they're all a little still discouraged and they decide to go fishing. And they're not catching anything. 
In verse 6, Jesus from the shore cries out. He had said, children, have you any fish? I said, no. He said, cast the net on the right side of the boat. You'll find some. Any of you fishermen? Any of you like to fish? We got a few. Does it make any difference which side of the boat you cast your? That shouldn't make a big difference. You know, you're in a little boat. There and there. And, and the, the disciples say, well, Lord, we've been fishermen all our lives. We've grown up on Sea Galilee. We've been fishing. But uh, because you said it, cast it in on the right. So they cast it in, and now they were not able to haul it in for the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon heard that, it was the Lord. He put on his clothes, for he was stripped for the work. Not totally naked, but close. He was stripped for the work, sprang into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat dragging that full of fish. They were not far from land, 100 yards off. That's a football field. When they got on land, they saw a charcoal, charcoal fire there and fish lying on it. Where did Jesus get the fish? Yeah, he called them, you know, or however. He went and picked them out of the lake. And he's, he's frying fish. This is shore breakfast. Come and have breakfast, he said. Come and have breakfast. This is the second meal, he said. There were 153 fish, big ones. We won't talk about that. None of the disciples asked who he was. Jesus knew it. He took the bread and fish and gave thanks for it. This is the third time he had revealed himself. Twice with food. Isn't that interesting? When they finished breakfast, had a nice breakfast, wouldn't that have been something? And Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, and we got something to talk about. Don't you love this? Oh, mercy. And this is where Jesus three times asked Peter, do you love me? You said you would never deny me. Now, will you say I will love you with the act of the will? This is a strong word for love. Peter says, I have an affection for you. Do you love me with the act of the will? Yes, I have a strong affection for you. Then Jesus says, do you have that affection for me? Lord, you know all things. My will is weak. I'm not going to say that anymore. Howard Hendricks says this is the Simonizing of Peter. Uh, Peter finds out who he is. He doesn't trust his own power. He comes to trust the power of God. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And Peter did. And Peter gets... uh, a little ticked. And the story goes out that Peter is going to die before John. John's going to live long. And Peter hears it and he says to Jesus, I've heard that uh, he's going to live long and I'm not. And Jesus says to him, this is a big principle to get hold of. What is that to you? Feed my sheep. If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. There will be differences in your life between the person you're sitting next to and yourself. In your family, there will be differences. It may well be that one of you will decide to climb a mountain and die at 26. I think 26 he was. You've heard that? And another person will live to be 106. Here's a big point. The Lord's in charge of that. What is that to you? Peter, if one apostle lives long and you don't, that's not your business. I'm in charge of those things. It's a big thing to get hold of in life. Very big thing. The 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. It's a Mount of Olives. That's where he will return. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, this verse is uh, the Great Commission verse, and it's important. We need, it's important that we understand the Great Commission. The Great Commission is not go. The Great Commission is this way. In your going, make disciples of all nations. The commission says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Part of what the apostles teach us is that they were commissioned that in their course of life, they would make disciples and teach those disciples everything that the Lord had taught them. And all who follow Jesus follow that commission. We, uh, we follow in the paths of the disciples, in the going about, in our normal routine of life. We make disciples. This is not telling them to go someplace. It is saying in the going, in whatever you do. Bear in mind, they went. There's no question about that. The commission is to make disciples. Wherever we go, we make disciples. And we baptize them. Earlier, the Lord had established the Lord's Supper, Thursday night, you remember? Now he institutes that other great ordinance of the church, baptism, the Lord's Supper and baptism. He promises to be with us in a special way as we are going about in all the world. This is more than just his general omnipresence. It's the special presence of the Lord Jesus Christ with each one of us. Recognize there are differences in his omnipresence, general in all the world, just like the Father and the Holy Spirit. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there's a special gathering. When God's people gather together, he is there in a special presence. He is there with us individually in a very personal part of his omnipresence. We are never alone. And that's what he's promising them. And you're going, you go into all the world and I will be with you individually in your uh, evangelistic and discipleship making ministry. I will be with you individually in the doing of that. The Apostle Paul knew that. Listen to what he says. He says, At my first defense of the gospel, no one stood with me, but the Lord was with me. That's an important concept. And that's part of what he is saying. He is with us in the day-by-day -day activity, even to the end of this age. And having said that, he went out and was raised up into heaven and realized this really happened. In the glorified body, we've seen some hints of the glorified human body. Goes through doors, appears and disappears. Now his glorified body goes up into heaven, up into the clouds. <coughs> a human body's never done that before. That's a new thing. Glorified human body can ascend into heaven, descend. That will happen again. He'll come back. We'll be able to do that in a coming day. When we have glorified bodies, we have no idea what that's going to be like. We have a little bit of an idea. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, whom you have seen ascend into heaven, will likewise descend. Mm -hmm.